and welcome to our EBAC accredited webinar from the ISCP's A to Z of CV Pharmacotherapy series. So today's program will focus on edoxaban engaging in individualization of the WEX. So today my name is Claire and I'm an ISCP governor for Singapore and also a senior pharmacist at Tan Tok Seng Hospital in Singapore. Uh, at the same time, I have my co-moderator here, who is Dr. Ann Leong, who is a lecturer and Master of Clinical Pharmacy Coordinator at the University of Hong Kong. And it's pl Hello. with pleasure today. Yeah. And it's with pleasure today that we are also joined by a fantastic faculty. Okay, so just to introduce us once again, so um, my name is Claire, and moving on, we have Anne, who is a lecturer at the University of Singapore, uh, University of Hong Kong and the, at the Department of Pharmacology and Pharmacy. So she's currently the program coordinator of the Master of Clinical Pharmacy and Master of Advanced Pharmacy program, and she will be leading the case discussions today. Uh, following, we will introduce our panelists today. Our speaker is Dr. Doreen Tan Su Wing, who is an Associate Professor of Clinical and Pharmacy Practice at the University of Singapore. So Dr. Tan's research interests include person-centered models of care, value-driven outcomes, pharmacogenetics, cardiometabolic disease management, pharmacotherapy, and drug interactions. Hello, everyone. So moving on, we uh, I'll introduce today our panelists. So first up, we have Dr. George Andre uh, Dan. So Dr. George Andre Dan is head of Internal Medicine University Clinic at the Colentina University Hospital, Bucharest, and head of the Cardiology Department and Diagnostic Cardiovascular Procedures and Arrhythmology Unit at the University Hospital of Colentina. Uh, Dr. George can say hi to our audience. Hi, hi everyone. Hi. Okay, and last but not least, we have our last panelist for today, who is um, Dr. Oscar Kalich. It's more or less correct, so Kalich. Dr. Oscar Latin Kalich language. is a professor at... <laughs> yeah, so he's a professor at the Latvian Center of Cardiology and Chief of the Arrhythmia Service at Paul Strandin's University Hospital. So Dr. Kalesh is very active in the field of clinical electrophysiology and participates in all national and many international meetings in the field. Uh, Dr. Oscar, do you want to say hi to our audience? Hi. Okay, so today's broadcast is supported by the International Society of Cardiovascular Pharmacotherapy and brought to you by Reptive Cardiology. So this will be an interactive session, which will actually feature a 10-minute live session Q&A. So pl please feel free to submit your questions to the faculty via the question module at the web page, and we'll endeavor to answer as many of them as possible towards the end of the broadcast. So to kick off the session, I'll hand over the time to Dr. Doreen Tan, who will be going to um, start her presentation on edoxaban, engaging in individualization of DOEX. Um, Dr. Doreen, please. Hello, good evening. Thank you for having me. I was told to give a very cheery welcome to say a ta-da! Here I am. Uh, so thank you for joining us in the evening. And uh, this evening, we're going to be talking a little bit more about Edoxaban, but I think it's quite important for us to also explore the overall um, overarching information about all the DOEX per se. So what will we cover for today? We will be thinking about the basics of the DOEX or NOEX, depending on where you're coming from, uh, disposition of the DOEX, the dosing of uh, DOEX in SPEF, which is stroke prevention in AS, and CTE, and three areas of key consideration for renal function, elderly underweight, as well as drug drug interactions. For the purpose of the presentation today, because it's going to be a really short time, I'm going to be focusing on the role of uh, idoxaban or DOEX in AS rather than VTE. So what are antithrombotics? As a very important topic that we have to cover uh, as an introduction, a lot of people are quite mixed up about antithrombotics, anticoagulants, and antiplatelets. So antithrombotics comprise of both the antiplatelets and anticoagulants, right? And then of course, the uh, group of interest today is really the anticoagulants and specifically the oral anticoagulants which are best represented by the vitamin K antagonists of VKA, warfarin, as well as the DOEX, the bigger trend, ribroxaban, apixaban, and of course, the drug of interest today, which is edoxaban. 
So let's go to a very uh, important cascade where the coagulation is concerned with every good pharmacotherapy lecture we must start off in the mechanism of action. So essentially, the all the sabans, the rivoxaban, epixaban, and doxaban class of agents are actually inhibiting the conversion of factor 10 to 10A. And that's why you can find the alphabet XA in the names of these uh, various DOACs uh, with respect to their naming nomenclature. The bigger trend very much inhibits the, uh, the, the conversion of factor 2 to factor 2A. And essentially, the, the, this whole class would be very different than the warfarin, which actually convert, inhibits the production of clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. So while this is quite indirect, the other agents, which are the newer agents, are actually more direct. And therefore, in various places, they could be called non-vitamin K oral anticoagulants. They could be called direct acting oral anticoagulants or target specific oral anticoagulants, clearly because of the difference in the mechanism of action. So this is a very busy slide, and obviously I'm not going to be going through every single detail right here. This is what I expect the pharmacy students to be memorizing. But for the purpose of the discussion today, I want to highlight a couple of points. And the first one is about the half-life of the various DOACs that we are referring to. And as you can see across the uh, DOACs, the half-lives of these DOACs are somewhat a little bit more than just half a day. And that's important because this is why we tell our patients to comply with the medications because the moment they miss one to two doses, they could actually be getting almost nothing in their bodies. That's as opposed to warfarin's half-life, which is a lot longer. And therefore, the lack of compliance probably is not as important for warfarin whereas it might be more important for the DOEX per se. The next thing that I wanted to highlight is really the protein binding. And the protein binding is very much involved with also how much the uh, drugs are variously cleared by dialyzability. And also how much is renally being cleared is a combination of both protein binding as well as renal clearance. And if you look at the profiles over here, edoxaban is very unlikely very highly cleared by dialyze, uh, dial dialysis as opposed to the bigger trend, mainly because the renal clearance, as we'll talk about in the next slide, is a lot less than that for the bigger trend. Whereas for the other sabans, they are very much liver, uh, very much dependent on liver and not so much of the kidneys, and therefore they're unlikely to be dialyzable. And the protein binding is uh, quite important with respect to the considerations of dialyzability as well. Metabolism-wise, the uh, two sabans that we're talking about, rivoxaban and pixaban, are very much uh, metabolized by the CYP enzymes, like CYP3A, and for rivoxaban, CYP2J2, and some others. Whereas for edoxaban and the bigger trend, you don't see so much of the CYP enzymes, so they are not as dependent on the liver clearance. And therefore, you don't expect as much drug drug interactions with respect to CYP3A4. Lastly, the important aspect of P-glycoprotein transport is an important consideration for all the DOACs, not so much for warfarin. And this presents to us new opportunities to be watching for drug-drug interactions involved with the PGP in, uh, proteins as well. So what is the disposition of DOEX like? If you look at this particular schema over here and going from left to right is where urine and liver is important, you would see the abbreviation draw and that's by uh, the bigger trend, rivoxaban, apixaban, and warfarin, right? So as you go from left to right, you are more and more dependent on the liver for clearance, whereas for the bigger trend, it's very much cleared by the kidneys as an unchanged drug. For edoxaban, I have put it right in the middle, mainly because it's 50% cleared by the kidneys. And uh, interestingly, it's not as cleared by the liver. However, a lot of it is being cleared in the bile and the feces. And therefore, the dependency on SIT is not as high as the rest of the NT10A inhibitors. So the guidelines now recommend the use of DOEX over VKAs uh, in SPEF. And uh, it's more wonder why, right? Because across the board, we know that the randomized controlled trials have shown very much favorable effect with respect to safety compared to warfarin. And this is the same for European or American guidelines. So what do ACs really do for SPEF? Well, the VKAs firstly reduce the risk of stroke by 64%, a whopping 64%, and the risk of death from AS due to stroke by 26%. So anticoagulation as a standalone is pretty much a very impressive way of preventing death with AS patients. Now, introduce the DOEX, and the DOEX actually reduced the risk of ischemic stroke by an additional 19%, and yet half the risk of intracranial hemorrhage by 50% compared to warfarin. Now, is that impressive or what? 
So going over to just the dosing of OACs for stroke prevention or theft in atrial fibrillation, I just want to highlight a couple of things here. And I, my, my goal is not to make everyone memorize the dosing because a lot of them have got their idiosyncrasies as you look at them over here. So I just would like to highlight that a pixaban and a doxaban are slightly different than the rest of the agents, mainly because they would ask you to adjust the dosage based on clinical risk factors. For example, for a doxaban, we look for any one of the risk factors like pyrethrin clearances of uh, less than 50, weight, body weight of less than 60, concomitant use of some of these uh, drug, drug interactions that we need you to adjust the dose from the usual 60 milligrams to 30 milligrams per day. The other thing that we want to watch out for is across the board, for anyone with crack clearances that's impaired, like crack clearance of less than 50, there's a need to think about dosage adjustments. For a pixaban, because you use that as, on top of any one of the other two risk factors, for rifoxaban and doxaban, it is an automatic adjustment from the original dose or the regular dose in AF to a reduced dose in AF. Right at the bottom over here, I'd like to call your attention to the um, creatinine clearances that are less than 30. i just like to highlight that for all the clinical trials involving the DOAX, that the people with crack clearances of less than 30 mL per minute have been excluded. Uh, and for the Pixaban, the people who have got crack clearances of less than 25 mL per minute have been excluded. So a lot of these recommendations are very much uh, based on the pharmacokinetic studies and essentially the labeling for Pixaban for hemodialysis uh, was very much based on PK studies as well. So the focus is on doxaban today and so I'd like to stress that the again based on the above recommendation anyone with crack clearances of 15 to 30 mL per minute you want to give 30 milligrams per day. The people with crack clearances of less than 15 doxaban is not recommended at all. So here, uh, someone asked me about this icon earlier, and these are like explosions. These are symbols for you to watch out for because they're additional considerations, especially when you're using drugs together, they're interacting with the various DOACs. So we'll talk about this drug drug interaction aspect a while later. Right here is the dosing regime for the treatment and prevention of VTE. And if you look at the uh, rivroxaban and apixaban, you find that it's quite unique in its dosing in what we call and so somewhat like an induction dose for rivroxaban and apixaban when you first start them off uh, in VT treatment. On the other hand, for the bigger trend and edoxaban, you need to start the therapy with parenteral agents in overlapping for about five days before you give uh, uh, the oral monotherapy of uh, the two agents uh, going forward. So for edoxaban, you might actually see some labeling that for people with supranormal or crack clearances more than 95 mL per minute, that edoxaban is not recommended. We will explore this a little bit later. So as mentioned, I will focus a little bit about the kidney function for a while. And going over to this very important slide, although it's very busy, just you have to trust me over here. What we're trying to say here is that the benefit of DOEX is preserved across deteriorating renal function. Okay. There are some key observations to pay attention to. Now, there's some controversy involving warfarin, with, and that's associated with the greater deterioration of renal function compared with the DOEX over time. And because of this particular relationship, it's believed that the VKAs are associated with nephropathy and vascular calcification, particularly in the TKD population, they are taking calcium as well as phosphate binders. And therefore, this could imply, and this again, I stress is implying, that the long-term outcomes could continue to improve beyond the one-year studies that we've seen in randomized controlled trials when you compare DOEX versus VKA per se. So again, this is a postulation, but the key thing is really that we need to pay attention to the fact that the benefit of DOEX is preserved across deteriorating renal function. So here is a schema from the Jack uh, reference in 2019, and it talks pretty much about the renal function spectra for which we should be using um, or DOEX, uh, basically in the AF population. And as I mentioned earlier, anyone with a crack clearance of less than 50, please think about adjusting the dosage. Anyone with less than 30, actually they were excluded from clinical trials, but a lot of the recommendations was based on PK studies. Anyone that's on dialysis, Actually, a lot of the studies with apixaban was based on PK, and that's why the recommendation for the US guidelines was to use apixaban in hemodialysis patients. But that population is another kettle of fish altogether and out of the scope for today's discussion.
So if you have difficulty trying to recall what we've just discussed over here, we have prepared a very nice pullout or cheat sheet for you on the uh, platform of the ICT website. And here there's a pullout sheet or a cheat sheet and you can use the QR code or the links in the slide over here. Uh, and this particular cheat sheet has got all these references on the dosage adjustments with respect to renal function. You can take a quick peek at our picture of this particular slide here as you listen. So I'd like to go over to a very basic assumption, and this is something that a lot of people have forgotten to take care of. This particular schema was published recently in the Jack Asia in 2022. And what this particular schema is trying to tell you is that there's a difference when you try to use a different equation to calculate EGFR or kidney function. So the key slide uh, the key message over here is to tell you to always use the krokov gold equation to calculate renal function when you're trying to adjust doses for DOEX. When you try to use the other equations, for example, ckd epi and MBRD, we know that these are very much used for staging of kidney disease and not as good for dosing. And this particular study has actually proven to us that the DOEX dosing has to be dosed off krokov gold equations or the creating experience has done of that. If you look at the particular reference over here, again, another clap is produced by ICP, you can get a bit more of the information on renal function and drug dosing from this particular clip. So what about people with too good renal function? And as mentioned earlier, there's this controversy that we shouldn't be using edoxaban in people with very high creatinine clearance or supranormal creatinine clearance, right? So essentially, this particular subgroup analysis is from the original ENGAGE study, which got the uh, labeled for AF, stroke prevention in AF. And you can see over here that there's a slight increase in uh, the incidence of stroke for the high-dose edoxaban group. And if you look at the schema at the bottom over there, you can see that the trust levels of edoxaban tends to become lower and lower as the renal function increases thereby causing this particular impression that supranormal uh, renal function could be a caution. This particular chart on the right-hand side shows you similar things to, as the one in the table on the, on the left-hand side. And because of the sensitivity involved with krokov gold equation and the assumptions as mentioned earlier, the krokov gold equation tends to overestimate creatinine clearance in this supranormal population. And therefore, this same group actually uses sensitivity analysis with ckd epi, which is a different equation to estimate renal function. And this relationship with the stroke and uh, outcomes that's increased even with a higher dose of edoxaban is also observed with respect to increased overwarfarin with a very good renal function population. However, I'd like to caution that we may be over-interpreting this subgroup population because it's really very small in the subgroup analysis. Overall, I think that we may be overthinking it because as a systemic stroke outcome with respect to both groups, whether it's warfarin or the high-dose didoxaban subgroups, and with this very high CHAT score of 3.5, the expected rates of stroke would be actually five over 5%. However, the stroke uh, risk, uh, if you see in both groups numerically, is less than 1.1%. And therefore, I would say that edoxaban in the high-dose dosing is still effective with respect to stroke prevention in AF. So again, this is another database study, and this is a Korean real-world study to show you that actually what we need to be paying attention to is this group again. And this is some signals here that seem to suggest that edoxaban has a higher risk of stroke compared to warfarin in the database. However, when this group looked in the subgroup analysis, they realized that these people with a higher risk of stroke were really the people who were inappropriately dosed with too low edoxaban dosage. And so this is a reminder to please prescribe the doses according to labeled dosing. If your patient does not have a reduced renal function, please do not reduce the dose of DOEX uh, because you're fearing uh, the risk of bleeding. Some considerations for the elderly, I think a lot of people are worried about falls in the elderly. So remember that even though in the uh, ENGAGE as well as Aristotle studies, the number needed to treat for those compared to a, a risk of falling versus those not at risk of falling, is still a very good number needed to treat. And therefore, we should not withhold anticoagulation from the elderly just because we think they are about to fall. The evidence in the elderly is very much preserved. And this is a network meta-analysis comparing all the DOEX Please do not read between too much in, into the lines because there's never been head-on studies and this is a network meta-analysis. Uh, however, what I just wanted to point out that the benefit of the ICHs is still preserved for all DOEX over warfarin. DOEX are still better than warfarin with respect to major bleeding, particularly for low-dose edoxaban and apixaban. And the stroke and systemic risk benefit is still going to be preserved across the board with some superiority suggested for Dabigatran, higher dose as well as apixaban.
So what about the extremes of body weight? You can see that for a edoxaban per se, we don't have to worry too much about the cachetic population. And therefore, that leads to this particular recommendation that since the labeling for both epixaban and edoxaban labels have got the body weight adjustments in their labels, you could actually use epixaban and edoxaban for low body weight patients of less than 60 kilos. However, again, please be very careful about the estimation of renal function and be using the correct equation when you're trying to estimate renal function. For the higher body weight, there's limited data, but it seems like rivoxaban and epixaban might be better. This last part is on the drug-drug interaction, and I think it's something that we have forgotten to think about. And this schema over here is to show you the different clearance mechanisms for the DOEX. And the DOEX have got extra considerations with respect to the protein transporters like PGP as well as OATP. The good news is, I think for edoxaban, that there's not that much of a dependency on these proteins, and therefore we don't have to worry so much about the use of edoxaban whenever you're worried about drug-drug interactions with respect to OATP or PGP enzymes. So in this particular schema, this is basically taken out of the EHRA guidelines. And just to remind everyone that there's a guide at the bottom of the table that you need to take care of, basically for the yellow shaded portions. If a person has got two or more yellow factors, then you need to think about dosage adjustments. If someone has got a red uh, box over there, you need to be thinking about contraindication for the particular DOAC. And for the people with blue, it means that the DOAC co-administration is reduced in terms of its efficacy and therefore you might need to think about modifying your choices. So this is an example of how the tables look like and if you focus on the top over here, uh, they talk about the PGP as well as 3A substrate mechanism and as mentioned earlier, edoxaban is not dependent on CYP 3A4 for its metabolism and therefore with any drug interactions with respect to CYP 3A4, edoxaban is a drug that you can consider because you don't have to worry so much about the CYP enzyme um, interactions as well. So where the yellow and the red and the orange boxes are concerned, as mentioned earlier, there's a guide. And if you saw somebody with, say, verapamil and perhaps an older person or someone with poor renal function, that's when you need to think about adjusting the dose for edoxaban. And this is how you use the table from the HRA guideline. So a little bit about the icp CLEP guide again. Um, and this is, again, shared with you earlier. There's this little blip about 3A4 and PGP and what the fuss all about. There are some drugs that are suggested over here. If you wish to have some sort of a reference, you can download the cheat sheet. And again, this is the QR code. On the front side, it talks about the appropriate renal function equation to be using and some suggestions of the dosing with respect to SPAT as well as BT treatment and risk reduction and, uh, and VT prophylaxis and a small bit about liver impairment and cirrhosis. So with that, i just like to conclude by saying that we are still a learning community because we're still learning more and more about the DOEX. And so I'll hand the time over to the panel for that case discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof Doreen, for the very insightful and excellent summary on DOEX. With the increasing use of DOEX, I'm sure we will find all these tables um, come in handy. Uh, so we'll have time for questions after this next discussion segment. So I'd like to remind you all to keep submitting your questions and we'll cover as many of them as possible later in the broadcast. But firstly, we'll now move on to our case presentation as well as panel discussion that will be led by Dr. Anne Leung, including um, our various panelists which will chime in to provide their expert opinion on the subject. Uh, Dr. Leung, over to you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Dorian. That was an excellent summary, and many of those concepts you brought up will be um, demonstrated through these cases. So today I have two cases. The first one is on atrial fibrillation. It's uh, a case that we see um, kind of often in Hong Kong. Um, so we have Miss XA, who is an 82-year-old lady. And she was actually admitted to the internal medicine ward from her follow-up at her uh, renal clinic. And so as you can see that she has CKD. Um, so she was at the renal clinic and uh, she was describing these symptoms of dizziness, shortness of breath and tarry stools for the last two days. So because of these symptoms, she was admitted for further investigation and management. She's hemodynamically stable and her oxygenation was, uh, was fine. Uh, when you look at her past medical history, she has proxismal AFib. Her CHAD score, CHAD's fast score is quite high at eight. You can see uh, because of her age, 82, as well as being female, having hypertension, a history of TIA in 2018, and also being diabetic and also having vascular disease 
um, she does have a significant stroke risk. Um, her last MI was in August of 2019, and she got one drug eluding stent at that time. Um, and following PCI, she completed six months of clopidogrel in combination with adoxaban. And then from then on, the clopidogrel was stopped, and she has remained on adoxaban since then. Uh, she has the TIA from 2018, diabetes, hypertension, uh, gout, and also uh, CKD uh, due to diabetes. And uh, in terms of imaging, her heart is structurally normal, uh, normal LV cavity size, uh, her ejection fraction is around 55%, and her valves are, are essentially normal. Um, and uh, very typical of our population here, her body weight is quite low at 40 kilos, and uh, she has no known drug, drug allergies. These are her home medications. She's on adoxaban 30 milligrams uh, PO daily, appropriately adjusted for her renal function, as you'll see in a little bit. Uh, on metoprolol 75 BID for rate control, ramipril 5 milligrams daily uh, for vascular protection, amlodipine 7.5 daily for hypertension, atorvastatin 40 daily post MI, linagliptin for diabetes, allopurinol for gout, and on pentoprazole 20 daily for just general gastro protection. In terms of her management in hospital, um, her adoxaban was held. Uh, in the next slide, I'll I'll just show you very quickly the hemoglobin. Um, she chronically sits at around the high sevens. On the day she went to the renal clinic, uh, they did her labs and uh, her hemoglobin had taken a small uh, decrease to 7.2. Uh, and along with the symptoms, that's why she was admitted to hospital. Um, so along with holding the anticoagulant, she received one unit of packed red blood cells, uh, started on IV pentoprazole and quickly went on to do an OGD, uh, but it was unremarkable. So her esophagus, stomach, and duodenum were all normal, and there was no source of upper GI bleed. Um, she stayed a, a few days in hospital. Her hemoglobin stabilized at 8.2, and there was no more uh, complaints of uh, blood parectum or melina. And the plan is to discharge her home with a plan for early colonoscopy. These are her labs. Um, so her creatinine sits anywhere from um, in the high 90s to 100s normally. On emission, there was a little bit of an AKI, creatinine 120. And this um, next part really demonstrates what uh, Doreen was talking about, that the um, EGFR and the creatinine clearance often varies quite a bit. So her EGFR uh, is usually in the high 40s and creatinine clearance sits around in the 20s. Uh, her lights were normal, urea was high. Um, uh, generally, uh, when you look at her CBCs, you can see that her MCV is um, normal cytic to slightly microcytic, and she definitely has a component of iron deficiency. Otherwise, not shown on the slide, folate, vitamin B12, all were normal. So then uh, given this case of uh, Miss XA, who is uh, going to go home waiting for a colonoscopy, uh, some points of consideration is what we would do about the anticoagulation on discharge. Uh, for a patient like Miss XA with uh, poor renal function, low body weight, and elderly in her 80s, which anticoagulant would we choose and, and why? And if we do continue with adoxaban, uh, what dose would we use? 15 milligrams or 30 milligrams daily? And uh, as Doreen alluded to as well, um, as her CKD worsens over time as she ages, uh, we also might have to think about adjusting our anticoagulation plan all the way into dialysis. Okay, so with that, um, I'd like to open the case up for the panel to comment. Perhaps we can start with Doreen. Oh, uh, actually, George. So, uh, first of all, I congratulate Doreen for the excellent presentation. In the short time, encompassing nearly all what is important in the in the dosage and the interference between uh, no up and uh, practical cases, renal dysfunction, elderly patient. Second, for, uh, thank you, Anne, for this interesting case. Uh, I would like at this moment only to point on two different things. First, what is certain is that this patient 
this nice lady uh, above 80 years deserve anticoagulation. This is no discussion about this. Second, <clears throat> there are several things I want to be a little bit tinted to provoke Doreen. I do not agree completely with the uh, paper of Cheng, which uh, who uh, told us that is uh, uh, to avoid the bigatran or edoxaban in people with low uh, body weight. But this is a uh, this is a challenge because uh, the main things we had in when the NOAC were introduced in the practice was that there is no monitoring. This apply to let's say 75 or 80 percent of population, but not to all. So for me, this patient could receive any of, of the uh, NOAC with a condition to have the possibility to have a correct dosage of the level, of the plasmatic level of the NOAC. This is one indication on the few indication when we need the dosage of the uh, NOAC. Second, as very important pointed by, uh, by Doreen and also by Anne, when we are counting the renal function, we should use the formula used in the studies, irrespective of the fact we consider this the most viable or not. Of course, like you all, I, I like very much the a, a CKD AP, but CKD AP was not used in the studies with NOAC. So we need to use Cockroft Gout formula, even it is not the, the, the optimal for uh, characterizing the, the renal function. And uh, the last thing <clears throat> I would like to, to point to this patient, I'm a little bit disturbed about the anemia of this patient. Uh, if you have seen, this is a decrease in hemoglobin, but the mean corpuscular volume is borderline normal. Mm -hmm. So it is very uh, low hemoglobin is not a contraindication for anticoagulation. This should be very clear for everybody. But in order to indicate an anticoagulant, uh, we should be very careful, especially in elderly person, in characterizing the anemia. It is probably of anemia of chronic renal disease, but I'm not sure about this. So this patient should be looked for any possible loss of blood because if there is an active blood uh, uh, bleed, the anticoagulant has no place uh, in, in this patient. <clears throat> and uh, I think it's enough. I, I stop now. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. So <laughs> Go ahead. Maybe we we'll direct the first questions of the case to uh, Prof. Doreen. So, I mean, in the case in your practice, if you see anyone with a uh, campaign for a GI bleed that is on eloxaban, um, elderly, um, low body weight, um, amongst all the NOACs, like which, what would be some of your considerations and what would be some of your preference from someone with such a history? I think this is a field that is quite uh, poorly lacking in evidence at this time. And uh, we, we have to be very careful about comparing the incidence of GI bleeds across all the randomized controlled trials because it hasn't been head-on studies comparing all the DOACs. Uh, there have were some suggestions early on that the bigger trend could be associated with higher GI bleeding compared to the rest. And some of the uh, meta-analysis seem to suggest that the safest uh, DOAC appears to be a fixed event. So I do think that the more important thing to do with some of the GI bleed is really to look at the cause of the GI bleed uh, and try to establish what it's about, treat that particular cause, because no matter what you do, if the cause is still there, no matter which duet you use, it's still going to be a problem for your patient. So I think that first and foremost has to be something that we need to look at. Um, it's a bit too premature to conclude that one duet is better than the other with respect to a recurrent oh, GIB. Yeah. I think the more important thing is waiting for a critical time period after whatever definitive has been done, whether it's going to be um, calturation or it's going to be any other way of stopping that bleed um, for at least a minimum of 7 to 14 days. And I think that's the recommendation across for restarting of any anticoagulation, Wafrid included. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Um, would the panel have a preference for uh, a pixaban, which seems to be the least renally eliminated for patients who have impaired renal function? Uh, if you ask me, I have no preference for uh, for a pixaban, especially especially in uh, in the elderly. I sincerely prefer doxaban because uh, it is one of the few who has checked in the frail patients, especially with the risk of fall. And uh, Doreen has very clear emphasized the very old paper. We need to have uh, uh, roughly 300 falls in order that uh, the fall is a contraindication uh, to, to um, uh, anticoagulant. So I, I, I have no preference uh, uh, for apixaban in this case. On the contrary, I would like to, uh, to give vedoxaban to this uh, lady. But again, you should be very careful because the renal function is marginal and the renal function is dynamic. So we need to monitor this patient to see if he, she or she is not crossing the border of the contraindication. Mm -hmm. And sir, uh, thank you so much. It's an excellent comment. And uh, uh, thank you, Dorian, your uh, perfect presentation. My third comment is the one I agree with you is a, a big challenge uh, for doctors and for all of in the same time for patients. We know doctors, what is the first problem typically for doctors is a bleeding for patients typically problem is uh, most problematic is uh, stroke and systemic embolism. But there's a challenge is here is a borderline, borderline and potentially uh, frail patients and elderly patients typically have a polypharmacy. And here is uh, my opinion, okay, I prefer uh, the same option, not a special preference to apixaban. Apixa, adoxaban is an excellent drug in this case. But uh, the one, uh, we must check the uh, concentration of the anticoagulant, check concentration. And another one, maybe we can move some pharmacy from morning to evening and another. Maybe some potential drug and drug interaction. Uh, probably, uh, for example, uh, atorvastatin. Potentially, maybe can, we can move the difference uh, between taking of uh, adoxaban and atorvastatin. It's a minus idea. The potential drug and drug interaction is a, a typical problem for elderly patients. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Prof. Uh, for your comment. <laughs> yeah, um, Dr. Ed? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I was also looking into uh, the dosing information in LexiComp and edoxaban has been studied in Japanese really elderly um, patients in their 80s in the elder care AFib trial in which they, if you feel like the, the dose according to label is not appropriate in terms of bleeding risk, you may decide to use even lower at 15 milligrams daily. Uh, has the panel had any experience with that lower dose of edoxaban? Not in Singapore, it also been just applied. It just came into our formulary in Singapore. <laughs> so I wonder whether George uh, or Osler had some experience. Uh, if I'm allowed, only a small comment on the challenge made by the fact that uh, in the edoxaban uh, control trial, a signal toward the less efficacy of the, uh, the drug in the higher uh, filtration glomerular rate. Uh, if you don't mind, I will consider this like much ado about nothing. Because if you are following the papers and these special analyses after uh, Doreen presented it in a very uh, good quality, you can see two very important things. That in the high uh, filtration glomerular rate, the incidence of uh, stroke and bleeding was very low, very low. So low that it is practically impossible to make uh, uh, statistical correct estimation of this signal. Of course, uh, there are uh, pharmacological mechanisms to explain uh, uh, rapid clearance of the drug, but putting, as uh, Doreen already uh, showed, putting in balance stroke and uh, heart, uh, uh, 
hemorrhage, the result is the uh, same. So this is, this is interesting. Uh, it is unusual, and I have seen in a lot of industry-sponsored symposia uh, discussing against the doxaban this aspect. Believe me, it has no clinical relevance. Thank you very much. That was very rich discussion over this atrial fibrillation case. Um, are we taking questions now or or after the last case? I think we can move on to the next case, then we'll round up with the last question and answer session. Okay. So then um, our second case, uh, we're switching gears a little bit to a young lady now, a 24-year-old uh, woman uh, who was admitted to, uh, uh, to, to the emergency room uh, due to a left lower limb DVT. And uh, the way she presented was she noticed uh, left posterior calf and thigh pain and numbness for about a day. And then she uh, started to get uh, alarmed this morning when she started to notice that her, her left lower limb was looking a little bit purplish in color. And upon physical exam and imaging, um, they found that her left lower limb was mildly swollen and cyanotic. Calf, of course, was very tender. Um, bilateral femoral pulses were still strong and symmetrical. Uh, bilateral temperature uh, felt around the same, and she was hemodynamically stable. Uh, when uh, they imaged her lower limbs, they found on the left side there was lower limb DVT, grossly distended left iliac, femoral, and popliteal vein. And uh, they also found on CTPA acute pulmonary embolism involving bilateral lower lobar and segmental pulmonary arteries. And so with all this imaging, she's newly diagnosed also with something called may Thurner syndrome, uh, basically where her common iliac vein and external iliac vein on the left side is occluded due to an underlying compression. And we'll uh, have a picture to depict that in the next slide. Importantly, she does not have any family history of, of related to DVTs or VT. And her only home medication is a new um, combined oral contraceptive, mm -hmm. Yasmin, that she started a month ago. No known drug allergies, and she's about 48 kilos. So uh, before we were talking about May uh, Thurner syndrome, basically it's where the right iliac artery, where it crosses over the left iliac vein, um, the, it places a bit of compression on the left iliac vein. And because the left iliac vein is a bit narrowed, it predisposes the patient to forming DVTs on the left side. And typically, this is uh, usually found when uh, patients are first diagnosed with a VTE and they get all this extensive imaging done. So she's a young lady, otherwise healthy. So her labs are what you would expect. Her creatinine is great. Uh, her EGFR is greater than 90. And if you do use the Cockroft Gold, then it's above 100. Um, otherwise, uh, her platelets are borderline. It was normal and then borderline high uh, on discharge and um, really nothing remarkable on her blood. Um, but she was admitted for about a week. Uh, she received unfractionated heparin first, uh, was switched over to enoxaparin, and then in preparation for discharge after five days of parenteral anticoagulation, uh, switched over to edoxaban. And her discharge medications were edoxaban 30 daily, uh, which is appropriately dosed because uh, of her weight, less than 60 kilos, and on famotidine for gastroprotection. In terms of workup, uh, most of the additional blood work uh, circled around autoimmune diseases, uh, such as uh, ANA, ANCA, and some, some um, blood work was found to be borderline positive, like the ANA uh, titer of 80 and C3, C4, that was just a little bit high. Uh, but overall, there was no diagnosis of any autoimmune diseases. Uh, there was no uh, thrombophilia workup at this time. Uh, we did see that there were orders for uh, protein C, S antithrombin, and lupus anticoagulant, but perhaps we think they were cancelled because the patient was already on heparin for anticoagulation at that time. Uh, it's not clear from the notes whether she was advised to stop uh, her oral contraceptives, but uh, for the purpose of this discussion, we'll assume that she has. 
So um, she was offered two two directions of care um, because of the May Thurners. Um, one was to uh, do vascular surgery, endovascular thrombectomy, uh, and angioplasty, plus or minus stenting of the common iliac and external iliac vein, uh, and if needed, plus or minus uh, an in, an IVC catheter, uh, IVC filter to be inserted. And the pros of that would be uh, faster resolution of symptoms, uh, redu- reduced risk of post-thrombotic syndrome, and her anticoagulation can then be limited to six to 12 months after stenting. However, uh, as she's a young lady, um, there was discussion about um, potential effects on pregnancy in the future and that um, this, a stent would be required to be inserted. So the other way is uh, conservative management where she continues on anticoagulation. Um, however, she would then require lifelong anticoagulation to be reassessed. So uh, because her uh, symptoms were relatively mild with on discussion with her family, the patient did decide to go for um, conservative management and went home on a doxaben. So then three months later, uh, she comes back to the eMERGE and uh, complains of about a week of bilateral calf pain. Her left lower limb turns purple after walking for a few minutes, but her, her right limb is fine. Hemodynamically stable, oxygenation is fine. Uh, no signs and symptoms of pulmonary embolism like chest pain or shortness of breath. Um, and she claims that she's been very compliant to the adoxaban. And uh, upon examination this time on Doppler ultrasound, a non-occlusive thrombi was found in the, dil- in the dilated left common femoral vein. There was no thrombus in the left femoral vein and the popliteal vein, and the right side was completely clean. And uh, CT thorax was done. Her pulmonary embolism from two months ago had completely resolved. So then these were her labs uh, on on the recurrent VTE. And so as you can see, it's pretty similar to last time, still great renal function. So some uh, questions to consider um, are the contributing factors to recurrent VTE in, in this young lady and whether additional investigations would be beneficial, uh, how we can alter this lady's management to prevent recurrent VTEs, and then circling around the um, excessively good renal function, is adoxaban the best choice for her? So with that, I'll open it up to the panel again. Maybe we can get um, Prof. Oscar to share his thoughts about the case. Oh, okay, let's yeah, meet uh, again. Uh, sorry, sir, Oscar, sir, go sir. on. Ah. No, 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 sorry, sorry, Judge. Go on. But it's if we have a relatively young, a young uh, lady and uh, potentially a uh, relevant high risk of uh, thromboembolism. Maybe it's not so often disease, but I always remember Trozo syndrome is a potentially elevated risk of uh, thrombe- thromboembolism. This uh, migrants, uh, thrombophlebitis migrants is potentially risk of oncological disease. It's a one of idea. It's mm-hmm. a potentially risk of oncology. It's a question why? Why we have so high risk for thromboembolism? Why we have this provocation of hypercoagulative status? It's the first my idea. It's a young lady. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Prof. Oscars. Uh, maybe I'll highlight some things from the case uh, from the case that we can discuss. I think one thing that I'm I I saw was that she was on Edoxaban um, 30 mg daily, but actually she has like a really good crack clearance, which um, by the dosing schedule, would, we would have dosed her at 60 mg daily. So I think um, Epixaban falls into this category where um, if you fulfill two out of the three criteria, you will start to dose adjust. Um, same thing for Edoxaban, it's other crack clearance or weight issue. Um, maybe I'll pass this question to Prof. George. Um, in your in your setting, if you encounter someone like Miss ED, where her weight is less than 60 kg, but her crack clearance actually um, is super normal, uh, even though I think you did mention just now that the super normal crack clearance of um, nine, more than 90 doesn't really affect um, the stroke or 
um, the stroke risk that much, uh, would you still choose to dose the patient at 60 mg or you will go ahead to do the six less than 60 kg at 30 mg daily? First of all, I would like to, to congratulate for finding such a rare and interesting case. I should confess I'm ashamed about this. In 50 years of experience, I have seen three cases. That's all. My experience with maid armor cases. It's not, not so fragment, or maybe we overlook the cases because uh, we are looking to other things. The only comment I would like to make to this case not because it's so young, he, she was also on contraceptives, but I remember that the quote, if you hear the hoofbeats, sings to horses and not to zebras. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I am not sure about this. I am not sure that the, the May Turner syndrome of this uh, uh, young lady is not uh, masquerading for other, something else. And let me to put a, a a question to you, which was your explanation for the calf pain the patient has even three months after the correct therapy with anticoagulants? Uh, in the description, you have said that the peripheral pulse is normal, but it is not enough. Have you any proof of the arterial competence, beginning with a simple ankle brachial index or something, in this fashion, because what I'm thinking about, mm. besides the May Turner syndrome, if this woman is not a candidate for thrombophilia, I have mm. seen that you have looked for something, probably for the antiphospholipid syndrome, but incomplete. Mm. Uh, but there are other forms, like, for example, the, uh, uh, the five-factor Leiden, which is especially augmented by the contraceptive drugs, or thrombin 200, 210. Uh, so what's the explanation for the, the symptoms of this lady after the correct treatment, and what to do next in order to be sure that the thrombophilia is not present in this woman? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I was looking retrospectively at the charts, and it looks like these were all of the investigations that were done at that point. But absolutely, I think um, making sure that all the other possible underlying causes of uh, thromboembolism is very important to, to uncover. And you're absolutely right. I had to reach out to all my clusters uh, connections in order to find this one case. <laughs> So maybe I can jump in at this time. I, mm -hmm. I think the more important thing to examine right now is uh, the diagnosis behind why she had that DVT or the PE in the first place. And I think the discussions from uh, Professor George and Oscars were both very important considerations. I think the key thing behind excluding all these other underlying issues is to see whether there are other things that we need to pay attention to. In the case of Professor Oscars, yes. I think he's concerned about whether there could be some oncological or cancers that we, are, we might be missing and that is a very legitimate uh, consideration to think about. On the case of uh, Professor George, I think he's concerned about whether there's thrombocilia and I think that for that particular consideration that would um, influence our decision for the duration of anticoagulation going forward, whether it's going to be indefinite, lifelong or it's going to be a short course. So all this workup is critically important and we have to remember that the use of OACs in any form, whether it's IV or it's an oral form, it would uh, get in the way of a proper diagnosis of some of these clotting factors if it were to work out for thrombocilia. And so it's critical that we, we do them all properly right at the start, rather than having to think about when to disrupt the oral anticoagulation in order to work the patient up again. So I think the, the considerations on both parts was important. I think the, the two of you wanted us to talk about whether the renal function and then the low body weight, because in, in, opposite, in opposite directions, right? Whether it's really mm -hmm. that appropriate to be using Edoxaban for this particular lady. Uh, I have to say that there isn't much information about the use of Edoxaban with respect to very good renal function in the population of the BTE population. Uh, but that, that information that we had about the supranormal mm -hmm. renal function applies to the people with Beth, and that was the specific AF population. So to be honest, we don't really know about how what the impact is going to be with a very good renal function with respect to VTEs and PEs. Um, I would say that we, instead of picking on which 
o- OAC we should be using. We should be really, really great <coughs> that we have so many different duets to choose from today. Um, and I think critically, because there's so many things to consider, it's not just about the body weight or the renal function. There's also drug interactions that we need to be concerned about. Um, those are things that we might want to think about whenever the approach of um, the WACs should be taken. And I think in different countries, the funding mechanisms are different. In Singapore, for example, uh, DOEX uh, like Rivroxaban and Apixaban are a bit more uh, affordable. And recently, Apixaban has entered the standard drug list. And so that becomes the most affordable uh, DOEX for us. Mm. And therefore, we see a lot of prescribing towards the direction of using Apixaban rather than the other DOEX. And because the Doxaban entered the picture rather late, it's still not subsidized. And so therefore, you don't see that much of prescribing with the Doxaban. Um, at the conclusion of my, of my segment, I did say that we're a learning community. And I think that it's critically important for us to look into how the eggs are being used in our real world populations. Because um, I think you mentioned earlier about the elder care uh, AF study, and, and that was the 15 milligrams of edoxaban that was used, right? Uh, that particular mm. population was particularly in octogenarians in Japanese. Uh, mm. Whether that same benefit is going to be extrapolated to Caucasians or to Southeast Asians like us, we don't know. So I would be ca- we'll, I'll be very careful to try and extrapolate that small group population to all other populations all over the world. Uh, and so I think it's important for us to be grounded with the fact. So coming back to this lady with the DTE, I probably, mm-hmm. in the light of Singapore's practice, would have used a PIX event <laughs> simply because it's funded. Um, but it's also difficult to answer the question whether it could have been useful for her. Perhaps when she came back with the recurrent uh, DVT, we could have tried another agent. Or we mm-hmm. could first exclude whether she was compliant with her DOAC. Mm-hmm. Um, or whether she was actually even taking her OCs unbeknownst to us. So there are many other things that we should be thinking about first before maybe trying to decide on which DOAC to be, to be um, choosing right up front. So I guess my the moral of the story I'm trying to make is really important to, over, to look at our patients holistically, consider all risk factors involved. Same thing for the risk of GI bleeding. I think it's fairly important to look at uh, whatever we can minimize with respect to use of high-risk drugs. For example, if someone is on an antiplatelet as well and we could stop that earlier, uh, or if someone was using NSAIDs without our knowledge, uh, stuff like that can be uh, addressed up front uh, before the first bleed occurs. So I think by and large, um, it's fairly difficult to say that evidence-based for us to choose one duet over the other. It's probably more a bit of experience, a little bit about patient risk factors, the clinical risk factors, renal function, body weight, blah, blah, blah. There's so much to, to be thinking about. And therefore, therefore, it's important for us to be really grounded when we try to choose the DOE and then dose the DOE correctly. Let's not dose them wrongly. I think that is the, the, the summary I would make for today. Absolutely. I think through these two cases, um, what really has come out is um, looking at underlying causes as well, rather than uh, being... Um, very focused in exactly which DOAC, what dose, and and so on. And uh, absolutely, uh, in our practice, we will refer back to the claps that um, that Doreen has showcased because it looks like a wealth of really great information. Thank you oh, very oh, much, thank panels. You. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Oh, Leung, for sharing this interesting case. Uh, yeah, Prof. George, if something to add. I would come back a, a little bit to the case with the young lady. And the, mm. if you have contacts with uh, this patient, I would uh, continue investigation for the thrombophilia for many reasons. One, already emphasized by Doreen, the duration of anticoagulation. But one is even more important. What anticoagulant? Because it is thrombophilia. We have no mm. love proof for NOAC. And maybe this lady should be put back to warfarin. Mm-hmm. That's a really important Thank you, Prof. Point. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, thank you very much for an excellent session today. Today's proceedings will be available on demand at radcliffcardiology.com in a little bit. So please go there again if you would like to revisit the session or forward to your colleagues. And so before we go, um, we'll like to thank our faculty today for their fantastic contribution. Uh, Doreen, really excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Um, George, thank you for being with us. And as uh, nice to meet you as well, Oscars, and um, my co-moderator, Claire.
Yeah. Um, all right. So um, today we've talked a lot about uh, CLAPS and all of all the all the other resources available through ISCP. Uh, we would like to take this opportunity to invite you to become a member. Uh, as there are uh, many benefits, including access to journals and newsletters and uh, a lot of uh, discounts, et cetera, on, on uh, Congress. So uh, if you would like to sign up, please uh, scan this QR code. And then uh, I would like to also let you know the date for the next session. Uh, in our A to C series is going to be on Entresto, Valsartan Segubatrol. Should we hef or empef and blow it off? Um, so it's on Wednesday, October the 5th at the same time. Uh, for those of you in Hong Kong and Singapore, it's uh, 7.30 to 8.30 uh, or 1.30 to uh, 2.30 CET. With that, uh, finally, our thanks to you, our audience, for joining us. We hope that you have found the session insightful. And remember, this event is CME accredited, so please don't forget to submit your details to claim your certificates. Thanks a lot, and have a good evening or a good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.